and welcome to another episode of Tuesday Tips. I'm Pam Kaslauskas, and today as part of our Mastering the MOR series, we're going to be looking at tenant files. One of the most common questions that we get when it comes to tenant files is what should my files look like? What order should be, things be in? The answer to that is that HUD does not have a particular order. So that means that it's up to you to decide what order your files are going to be in. There are a couple of common options. We generally either see people using a divided file, so one of the files with a different number of dividers in it, and then they section it off as per owner agent policy. Or we see some people that put their tenant files into a binder, again, divided by sections. There is no right way to do this. Some section by year, some will section by type of document, so they'll have, say, all of the leases in one place, um, all of the moving things in one place. So it's really up to the owner agent to set the particular order of a file. What we do look at though, is what those tenant files should have. So not necessarily what order they should be in, but what needs to be in there. So some of the things that need to be in there include your application screening and move-in information. So everything from the point that someone applied to the point that they moved in, including that after move and EIV report. You're also going to have in that the most recent three years worth of certifications. So the current year and then two full previous years based on the tenant's certification date. Then again, everything related to that move in. In the tenant file should be anything related to any EIV discrepancies that you found and resolved. And then any of your EIV income and summary reports included as part of move-in, annual, and then interims if you are currently doing those. Then there are some things that should really not be in your tenant file. So the things that you do not want in your tenant file are one, duplicate or conflicting information. This is a common source of questions and potentially findings at your MOR. And what I mean by duplicate or conflicting information is, for instance, let's say that the tenant gave you their yearly e uh, social security statement and you also pulled EIV. If the social security benefit letter says they're getting $1,000.10, and the EIV report says $1,000, that's conflicting information. So as long as the information is accurate in EIV, that's what you should be seeing. And then if you have gotten anything in the process that conflicts with that just by virtue of having pennies, you can get rid of that. Another thing that should not be in there is VAWA information. VAWA information has specific guidelines on protection. So you want to make sure that that is either sealed in an envelope so that people can't see it or preferably in a completely different file so that it's not in the active tenant file that people are reviewing. You want to be very careful about irrelevant information, information that we're not using. You don't want to have copies of actual social security checks in the file. And you don't want to have things like specific disability diagnoses. So I may need to know whether somebody qualifies as disabled or whether they have a need for the features of an adapted unit, but I don't need to know what their specific medical diagnosis is. And then you want to be careful of information that is related to a different regulatory body. This is particularly concerning with tax credit properties. So generally speaking, you're having two files. You're having your tax credit file and your HUD file if you have both of those regulatory bodies. You can certainly, to make your life easier, copy the information and then just place a copy in each of those files. But LIHTC reviewers really shouldn't be seeing your HUD information and your HUD reviewers really don't need to see your tax credit information. So be careful of that when you're doing files as well. One reminder here is that 
When we are looking to verify social security numbers, a common misconception is that you have to get a copy of the social security card. You do not. HUD actually specifically says it's not mandatory that the card itself be copied. What you need is something that verifies the number. And there are a few different ways that you can do that. If you take a look at Appendix 3 in the 4350.3, that will give you a number of different ways that you can verify. So I do have a slide that shows you that. So here we go. This is the Appendix 3. It's hard to read because it's very small. But if you go into the 4350.3, whether you have that electronically or by paper, and you look for Appendix 3, which is going to be in the back of the handbook, you can see that HUD gives you a list of all the different things you can use to verify. It's not a bad idea to keep a copy of this handy so that when you're looking at documents that your tenant has given you, especially in those short time to process certifications, you can look at the different things that you can use to verify. One caveat on that though is that Hotma may change this, so you do want to be aware of that as well. This right here has drilled down into what the Appendix 3 says about social security numbers. So you'll see there are a number of different things that we can get. We can look at the original social security card, um, an original document issued by another agency that shows the social security number, or um, some of the what used to be called TPQI benefit printouts from social security will have the number on it. There are some driver's licenses that print social security numbers on them, depending on what state you're in. So if the tenant for any reason does not want to give you their social security number or card, or if the applicant doesn't want to do that, you can look for other methods of verifying. You just need to make sure that you have something that verifies that social security number. When it comes to verifying disability, you have to be very careful about what specific information is in the file. You need to know that somebody is disabled and needs what they're asking for, but you don't necessarily need to know their specific diagnosis or the specific nature or extent, remember, of disability. So we all know that the doctors and you know other healthcare providers out there tend to provide us with the notes if you get a note instead of the verification form that will contain information we don't need. They'll say things like, Mary has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and has X, Y, and Z limitation and takes X, Y, and Z medication. We don't need to know all that. We need to know, yes, she has a disability and yes, she qualifies for an adapted unit. So should you get a healthcare provider letter that has all sorts of information that you don't need, you want to be careful to exclude that from the file. You can do that one of two ways. You can redact it, which means you would just black out the name of the specific diagnosis or you know the information that you don't need and then note the file that you've redacted that specific information. Or you can keep the specific note in a separate file and make a note in the tenant file that states, physician provided note that confirms that the person has a disability and go from there. So again, what you need to know is, does the individual meet the definition? Do they either need what they're asking for when it's an accommodation or modification? Or do they qualify for a specific unit? There are some projects where eligibility for the project or for a specific unit is tied to whether that person has a disability or in some cases has a particular type of disability. So the ideal way to get that is to send out a set verification form that only gathers the information you need, but you do often get those notes and you just wanna check them. You may need to ask, is the disability permanent or not? Um, there are some times where a person has a disability but may get surgery to correct it or, you know, for some other reason may not remain disabled 
for the rest of their life. So you may need to be asking if it's not permanent, how long is it expected to last? And again, as long as you're not asking for what is their disability? You know, those are the questions that you can ask and the information you want in the file. So here's an example of a physician's note. I've treated Jane Schmidt for the last 10 years. She suffers from multiple sclerosis. She can't ambulate without assistance, uses a wheelchair, walker, or cane, and she requires an accessible unit and parking space. So there's information I need there and information I don't need in there. So I'm going to redact that. I've treated Jane Schmidt for the last 10 years. She suffers from, and I've taken out the diagnosis. She uses, I don't need to know what specific uh, equipment that she uses. Therefore, she requires an accessible unit and parking space, right? So I know she's disabled. She needs a parking space. And then you'll see there's a note at the bottom here. This is the note that I would put in the file. It basically just references specific information on disability has been redacted. Physicians confirmed she's disabled and she needs what she's asking for, sign and date. Okay, so that's an example of a redacted one. If items are kept separately, here's the kind of note you could put in the file. Uh, tenant voluntarily provided a copy of a letter, but that indicates you know, a lot of information that I don't need. And after review, we've decided that yes, it confirms the existence of a disability. Yes, it confirms the need, sign and date. So in this case, that actual note is going to be kept wherever I keep, you know, personal correspondence, things like that. And this note is going to be kept in the file. That way, if somebody needs to see that original note, you have it. But in the file that's being reviewed, you don't have information that doesn't necessarily need to be there. So when you're Organizing that file, there are some helpful hints to, to keep in mind. One, file items promptly. Don't stick them in there loose and intend to file them later. We all know that housing is a very busy arena and it's very difficult sometimes to get back to things later. So file items promptly and file them securely. Do not leave loose paperwork in your file. It's very easy for things to go missing and it makes your file more difficult to review. Make sure that you have a consistent order for your files that's generally sent by the management agent who will say, this is our file order, this is what sections we have, but make sure that you're following that order consistently and secure your files appropriately. Depending on what your policies are, that could mean a locked drawer in a locked cabinet, could just mean a locked cabinet, a locked office, and you wanna make sure that you are limiting access to appropriate personnel. So you wanna make sure that only the people who should be in there have access to those files. Further tips, cover sheets are very helpful or a file guide. They're not required, but it does help when we are reviewing your files to have a general idea of what order we should see things in. Some people do a cover sheet for each section. Some just have a file system guide that they will give us, but it does really help to have that so that we can get through your files quickly and easily. Another thing to note is that depending on what file system you were using, you know, the secured files with the clips or a binder, it may be more helpful to have single-sided copies rather than double-sided. I know that we all want to save paper, but double-sided copies often make the file a little harder to review. And sometimes that can result in things not being seen. So you always want to think of making that file easy to navigate, easy to find things that we want to see. One of the Common questions we also get too is, what do we do with RSCs who need to see EIV copies? Because sometimes RSCs are helping with benefits and need social security information. RSCs, your resident services coordinators, may not see EIV printouts unless that happens with tenant consent. The best way to do that is to provide a copy to your tenant and let the tenant provide it to the RSC. Generally, you're not going to use that third-party EIV consent with your own staff. 
So it is always a safer bet to provide a tenant with a copy that they can share to the with the RSC if they want to. You want to make sure that you are making notes and using consent forms. If you are providing any copies of anything in the file to a third party, um, HUD does not dictate anything other than the EIV third party form. So anything other than that, you are going to be providing on whatever the owner agent's form for release is. And again, we talked about multiple regulatory bodies for files before. USDA, LIHTC personnel, none of them at present can see actual EIV printouts unless a tenant is discussing it with them and wants to share that. So you are going to potentially put a note in the file. Let's say I have a USDA property with a HUD subsidy. As far as social security verification goes, I am either going to get an award letter and use that for my USDA file or write a note in there that I have used the EIV system and I verified that the social security amount is X. Um, some regulatory bodies will accept that. Others may not be as willing to accept that. So you may need to get some other proof like an award letter. What do we do about prior errors that we can't fix? Either things that happened under another management company or things that happened with our staff, but happened five years ago when there's no way to fix them. The best thing that you can do with these is when you come across something like that, note the file, put a note in there that says what happened and what you did to address it. So for instance, I noticed that the existing tenant search wasn't run for an applicant. When I'm looking at that file as the owner agent, I'm going to go into that file and go up. Oh, we didn't run that check. So I'm going to put a note in the file that says noted during a quality assurance review or during, you know, processing an annual research, whatever it was, we noted that the existing tenant search was not run for this applicant. You're going to then advise of the corrective action. Um, if I'm the regional, I might say reviewed EIV policies with existing staff. And in the future, this is how we're going to ensure that that doesn't happen again. In some cases, when you do that, you've noted that there was an error, you identified it, you fixed it. It may mitigate or lower the, the points, if you will, lower the severity of a finding because you have identified the problem and addressed it. So you always want to do that if you come across prior errors. So I have a couple of examples for you. First one is, you know, owner agent review noted that existing tenant search was not run for this applicant's move in. We attended EIV training on a particular date. We reviewed the requirements with the staff and moving forward, this is going to be run for everybody sign and date. There's another one for a 90 day EIV report. This report wasn't run for this tenant's move in. This move-in occurred under a prior management company sign-in date. And as I said, in some cases, that's going to either mitigate or kind of temper that finding because you've already noted it, addressed it, corrected it. So in summary, looking at these files, again, the owner agent sets the order. You just want to make sure that the file order is consistent for all your files. You want to have the most recent three years plus the move in and the move out if it's a move out file. With the move outs, make sure you have your final account statement, whatever your final paperwork is that you hand out to tenants when they move out, final account statement, a letter with security deposit information on it, whatever it is that you do for a move out, make sure that's in your move out files. Ensure that you're filing your paperwork promptly and securing any loose paperwork. Make sure that you're noting any unusual situations or unfixable errors. Remove any unused, duplicate, conflicting information from the file. If there's conflicting information for a legitimate reason, let's say your tenant has reviewed their EIV printout with you and says, no, that's not accurate. My benefit amount just changed. 
So you ask them to bring in a, a benefit letter and both of those are in the file for a legitimate reason. Make sure you're noting that. Tenant reviewed the EIV printout, said it wasn't accurate. So I asked for follow-up documentation and this is what I got. You wanna make sure your files are secured so only those people who should see them, see them. And the best thing to keep in mind when you're deciding how to do these tenant files is your file should tell a complete story. Anybody that is coming in to look at your file or if you think of somebody covering your office should be able to pick up that file and know the complete story. Why did you count what you counted? Why didn't you count X, Y, or Z? Why are there two pieces of information in here that say different things? You're having your file tell a story that is, this is why I did what I did. This is why I have the amounts that I have. And that kind of prevents any questions on why something's in there, why you use this number. That's gonna help you to have your reviewer get in your building, through your files, and out of the building as quickly and efficiently as possible, which is all of our goals. We don't wanna keep you away from your work any longer than we have to, to do this review. And we wanna give you a chance to shine at your review and show us how well you're managing this very complicated business that we're in. So that is gonna do it for today. As always, you can contact us. You can contact Vicki Bell, our other trainer, or me with the information that's on the screen. Thank you for joining us for this Tuesday tip and we'll see you next time.